they are rigorous. There are many of them mathematical uh, in, in their statements. Um, and, and that rigor, that mathematical quality, is, is a really useful thing. Um, it gives us all sorts of possibilities and assurances that, that, that are nice to have. The problem is, of course, that um, those approaches are, for the most part, static. Some of them can be, you know, attempts are made to make them dynamic, but it tends to be clumsy. The same is true of resolution. The resolution tends to be very low, usually dealing with either very large units like, like uh, provinces or something of that sort, or arbitrary units, or maybe sometimes smaller statistical units, but almost never down to the resolution that we get in CA. Um, and so those are problems. Now, if we use the CA instead to deal with those sorts of uh, problems, then we, we sort of make up all these efficiencies. We have some other problems. In, um, but we would, we would immediately get the dynamic quality of the CA. We would um, uh, get uh, high resolution. And we also begin to make links with some other theory, um, other than the ones I was just talking about, if we were able to formulate them in terms of uh, CA. Because um, CA are the part of complexity theory. And I think that's another important route, not one that we grew away from, but we did grow away from it. But it wasn't one that was present in the models of the 1960s. 70s, but it's one that, in a sense, methodologically, we grew out of complexity theory, but we basically don't make much use of it any longer if we make any use of it at all. So um, um, that's, that's an important point as well, I think. Now, there are, of course, things we, we all know, we all do, that we can also include by using CA, like soil, soil quality, zoning, and so on, which don't basically, almost, they almost never cover the traditional approaches. Now, and I think basically there's just a synergy that we can find if we are able to combine our CA approaches with some of the um, theory of the classical fields and even maybe some of their methods. So, what I'm going to do here is now is I'll, I'll talk about this in two parts. One has to do with putting um, the domain knowledge from these fields, from the traditional fields, urban economic geography, planning, uh, regional science, into a CA framework. Um, and then I will, in the second part, talk about some of the links between CA and complexity theory and what we can, what we can draw from that by really paying much more attention to complexity theory as it's developed since CA grew out of complexity theory decades ago. So, first of all, I'll talk about incorporating the domain knowledge. Now, what I'm going to do here is just, because I'm not giving you the answer to anything here, I'm just going to give some suggestions to show that there are possibilities here. And I don't know how far the possibilities can be taken because I think we're not very far along in, this, in the direction of exploring these possibilities. A lot of what I'll talk about in the examples will be, I'll draw from some recent work we've been doing um, at, at VITO. Um, and, uh, but I will also use some other examples here and there. And then in the second part, of course, I'll talk about complexity. Now, in terms of uh, bringing the domain knowledge in, there are two approaches here that I've called conservative and uh, radical. The conservative is simply linking other existing models like input output, demographic models, and so on to um, the uh, CA. And the radical one is somehow to incorporate it directly into the CA, for example, into the transition rules. Now, the conservative ones where we link models, I won't really say much about this, I just really want to point out that this approach exists. I think many of you know already. But it is important, I think it will remain important. There are many applications, many cases where we really the best thing to do is to take pre existing models, demographic models, uh, economic models, um, natural system models, ecosystem models, and link them to a CA. Um, and this is sort of an obvious thing to do because if we th think of the land use line cover that we're talking about in um, CA models. That's always driven by some underlying activity. We, we, we sort of, the image we see on the, the, uh, on the uh, remotely sensed data is, is really a reflection of the underlying processes. And so um, what's driving those line changes are the things that are modeled, captured by those domain variant models, like the demographic models. And so the, the obvious thing to do is simply to take those existing models and link them to the uh, CA so that they drive it or constrain it. And of course, the links can also go in the other way. So that um, what's coming out of the city can, can affect what's going on in those domain areas. But what I want to come
concentrate on is this other approach of trying to put um, some of the domain approaches in the theory or into the CA so that, in fact, we can use the CA to perhaps extend the theory further than it was possible in the traditional work where they lack some of these things like dynamics and resolution, which for many of the graphical problems we deal with are uh, so essential to have. Okay, so here's an example from some of our recent work. Um, I just sort of give you a feeling for what's going on here because I don't want to spend a lot of time going into the details of the model. But the idea is to start with what looks like a traditional Langes model. It is a Langes model, line cover model, where, um, where each cell has a state that shows the, um, the Langes. Uh, but also to have each cell represent um, activities, what's going on in that cell. And so each cell has not only a land use, but an activity. It has a certain number of people living there, it has a certain number of jobs there in this or that sector and so on. So in fact, the, the cell state is sort of a combination of the land use and this vector of different activities. And it's important to mention that each cell can have a number of different activities. It may be a residential cell, but it will have a sort of, in, in addition to people living there, it may also have jobs in the commercial sector, and perhaps in the industrial sector, and so on. So we're into sort of a multiple activity, which is sort of a surrogate for multiple lands um, state here. Now the cell neighborhood, um, then, if we want to sort of emulate what goes on in the traditional models, where things interact with the distances, which in fact they do, uh, what goes on in you know, this part of the Porto, and some degree is going to affect what goes on in other parts of the Porto. Um, to take, to capture that effect, rather than have a very limited cell neighborhood, then we extend the neighborhood to cover the entire model region. And so what goes on in one place affects what goes on everywhere else. Um, and then the neighborhood effect, to, to keep a longer story short, is just that, um, that the neighborhood effect is just that the weight of some of all the activities, everywhere on the map, but the weight um, which are assigned to activities in different parts of, of the map um, depends on, on their location, specifically how distant they, how distant they are from the cell for which you're calculating the, um, the neighborhood effect. <coughs> so there's sort of a scheme out of the, the effects to various parts of the map on a particular cell there. Um, and here's a graph of the weighting functions you apply, you would apply to those activities uh, and line uses in various parts of the map, depending on how far away they are from the uh, cell for which you're calculating the neighborhood effect. Now what it looks like is you've got some very high weights here, like what, 600 is the one on the left axis here, and then they seem to go to zero for very short distance. They aren't actually zero. Um, what happens though is in this very local region out to, to a, that's a log base three to two, so if you're dealing, um, so that, that's a very short distance on the typical application that would be in that area, this big local there, out to about, say, a kilometer radius. Um, and then the rest of it is, is much further. So if you actually got to distance of 10, uh, well, you know, we don't in our graph we usually get that far, but this is a six is um, would represent uh, at a 200 meter re resolution that would represent um, I think 100 and, uh, 146 um, kilometers. So it, it, you can quickly um, cover long distances with this sort of thing. And so there are the actual figures, just so you can see they don't go to zero in, in the model region; they just become low. So what really is going on there is that the, the weights in that block outside that local region are actually um, represent a spatial interaction equation. So here we've brought one, um, one aspect of traditional theory, spatial interaction equations, um, into the CA framework by making it part of the neighborhood rule, the neighborhood calculation, which, which means it becomes part of the transition rule. So um, now I'm going to take these a little bit further. If we have um, a, the neighborhood effect tends to be positive. Mostly things like to be near each other. There are a few exceptions, but overall they like to be near each other. So the neighborhood effect tends to be positive. Um, and that represents, once you've got this large scale um, interaction effect in the weights, that represents what in traditional models would, work, would be agglomeration properties. Um, and these positive uh, effects in the neighborhood effect, because we're dealing with, with dynamics now, this, this feedback from one iteration to the next, that results in the long run in an actual agglomeration activity. You get clusters appearing and clusters growing larger. Now, um, what's the effect of that? Well, in traditional theory, um, as you get more of activity agglomerating in, say, a larger and larger city, uh, that happens because of all the positive effects, but at the same time, that, that very process generates uh, negative externality, so we get increasing congestion and higher land prices, and they're all, those are all things that tend to keep activities away from these, these clusters, so you get a sort of balancing effect going on. And the 
this economy's effect, this economy of collaboration, is, is again another one, of, another phenomenon that's treated in traditional theory. Uh, so to sort of sum up that, then the, the most accessible locations are the best locations. But because they're the best locations, they become the worst locations also. So you end up with a sort of balance between the two. And therefore, you want to include both effects in the neighborhood uh, neighborhood effect calculations. So you already seen how you would calculate the uh, the uh, positive effects through those ways. Um, but then we also have the negative effect included there as well through another sort of equation, and. Um, the net result is that we can calculate transition potentials to sort of on balance how good is the cell for various activities and various line pieces. Um, and so the cell state transitions and the activity levels of the various activities on that cell then will depend on these transition uh, potentials. And the transition potentials um, effectively represent um, Alonzo mu type um, uh, bid run surfaces. So we're, we're now, one, one way or another, incorporating a number of effects that appear in the traditional theory into the CA framework. And just to give you a, a picture here, there's a, a map of the transition potentials um, for residential land use. Uh, and this would also affect the allocation population here. Um, and the transition rule is that you, you know, keeping things simple, that you change um, cells to whatever they have the highest transition towards that land use. And then you also assign various activities as a function of how good are the potentials, uh, transition, how high are the transition potentials for those various activities on that cell, taking into account some other things like how compatible are various land use, various pairs of activities. And so the output of a simulation phase like this gives you these really two things. One, it's a traditional land use sort of map that's evolving in iteration by iteration, but also activity maps. Um, the change each year, where you see, like in this case, the population density, density because you, you know, the cells are all the same size, so the population of the cell will affect the density on that cell. Okay, so this I pretty well said already, but this, when we take this sort of approach that we've got to see that, that does deal with these four um, phenomena that are found in the classical the theory, the agglomeration effects, this economy of dispersal, bed run, land use allocation, and spatial interaction. But they're not dynamic and they're in high resolution. Um, okay, so if, just to take this a little bit further, this framework can actually replicate some of the results from the traditional theory. One of the traditional theories um, is sort of a, of a sort of a, uh, updating of um, classical central place theory, the sort of thing I was showing the hexagons at the beginning, where you have um, centers, retail centers or towns, cities, and so on being um, growing or declining or existing or not, depending on their spatial competition with each other. So they're, they're competing with each other in space for customers. And depending on how many they get in this competition, they make lots of money or they don't make so much money, and so they grow or they don't grow. And the result is a particular uh, pattern of, of, uh, of these centers. Then. Now, the spatial competition depends on two things. Basically, the size of the center, the bigger, the bigger it is, the more um, attractive it is, because there are more things you can say by there. Um, but also on the location, the nearer center it is to you, compared to other centers, the more attractive it is to you to go to that one, other than being equal like size. So we represent that in, traditionally by uh, something like a spatial interaction equation, in this case a gravity equation, um, where the two variables are size and distance, distance being the location measure. And I put in yellow here that this is exponent because the um, effective distance is always is discounted by some exponent. Um, and when we simulate this, what happens when we, we find that um, if the exponent is um, large, you get sort of a regular dispersal of centers. If it's small, things agglomerate. Now in the um, C8 framework, you can do the same sort of thing. You have weighting the weights for uh, activities at various distances from the cell that you're having the neighborhood for, given by, in this case, a gravity <coughs> equation. Uh, you have an initial set of, of, of uh, 
to what center. So here we've um, actually replicated a result that was originally gotten from in a, in a different sort of framework. And, uh, and we're doing this, we're getting this, this is the sort of question that would be asked and dealt with in the traditional theory of 30, 40 years ago. Okay, so um, that, I think that hope that gives you some sort of feeling that like there are possibilities, I think, for pushing more of the traditional sorts of knowledge and concerns into the CA framework and that there's something to be gained from doing that. But I think there's something also, a lot to be gained from looking at um, complexity theory more seriously and seeing what we can get from that. Um, and I think a number of comments here sort of illustrate that people talk about validation and the problems of validation, uh, verification. These are big problems we face, but I think there are good lessons to be learned from complexity theory here on those topics. So, um, just to give a brief outline of complexity theory, because I think everyone here obviously knows about CA, but I'm not sure that everyone knows about complexity theory, so I'll talk about that very briefly. Um, for us, it would um, provide techniques. It already has provided techniques that the CA themselves come out of complexity theory, um, or the roots of complexity theory. Um, and it also, in a sense, provides a theory, a very general overarching theory, not a domain specific theory, but that we can use. We can use that as sort of the, the, of the um, higher level framework for our theories that we develop. Um, now, there are two streams to what I just called complexity theory. I shouldn't use the phrase, because one of those streams is uh, the theory of self organizing systems, um, and that has a background in the natural science, it has a roots in the natural sciences, and it's, it is a sort of hard science oriented um, approach to um, complexity theory. Um, and the uh, other is complexity theory um, itself, properly speaking. Now, just to go into a little more detail on this, if you talk about complexity, if you look at complexity theory and CA, well, as probably most of you know, the CA were invented back in the 1940s um, at, at Los Alamos, and um, John von Neumann made use of them um, in some of his trying to work with some of his questions having to do with what does it take to replicate yourself. Uh, and then in the 1970s, when uh, John Conway uh, created the Game of Life, things became much more interesting, much more for many more, more people, because this was something that caught everyone's attention and everyone started playing with it. And then it was very quickly proved to be formally equivalent to a Turing machine, which meant that it could do anything a computer could do. You could effect effectively program a Game of Life to do anything. So um, that sort of that that put the idea, the fundamental idea of complexity theory, right in everyone's immediate consciousness that you can have this trivially simple um, set of rules and framework, like you have a game of life, two states of life and death, and a simple rule, and yet you can do essentially anything. Um, as a spinoff of all that, um, from Los Alamos, where Von Neumann and Willem had been working uh, in, I think it was the 1980s, Santa Fe Institute. Uh, and that became sort of the other route to complexity theory as we know it today, because people um, they, they took a, uh, and they took a computational approach to the subject. So it really was very one very much of, of computer um, games, if you like, simple computer models, and use that to explore some of the basic principles of, or of systems that organize themselves or generate complex behavior through simple rules. And there are a lot of uh, uh, interesting results from people like um, Sir Calvin and Chris Langton, which have to do with um, the nature of systems that, are, that have this capacity to generate complex structures, generate ordered results from simple initial states. Um, and those are, are ideas like someone said today in one of the papers something about the edge of, of chaos, that's this idea that complex systems are underbounded between uh, simple order and pure chaos or randomness. Um, that's that's one of these things. That it's not a proven result, but it's there are very suggestive results uh, that that it probably is true. And it's at this point also that you find fractal structures, which are in a sense infinitely complex but but ordered structures. Uh, and these are apparently the ones that have the ability to do things like in a sense compute. 
So that, that, those sorts of theoretical results from this uh, sort of phase two extreme complexity are very um, useful in providing us with sort of deeper insights into maybe what's underlying our results in areas like uh, urban theory, if we begin to develop that in the CA. Uh, now the other one, the self-organizing one, is, is the European branch, and this comes basically from the European regime that was at Brussels. And um, it's based in physical sciences, and he was a physical chemist, almost a physicist, I guess. Um, and his basic position is that these the self-organization, this appearance of complex macroscopic structures from initial disorder, uh, occurs because the system is being pushed further from thermodynamic equilibrium. The energy is being put into the system, and, and that's what allows it to do these interesting things. Now, because maybe some of you don't have a background in this sort of field, um, uh, thermodynamics, in that case you're like me because I don't have a background in it. <laughs> I'm going to give you a little simple cartoon presentation. But the other reason for this is I think, because I think this is important, and I think also if you have a simple image that you can, a picture that comes up, it's much more memorable and something you can sort of use in your schematic thinking than if you just have a first like, system as far from thermodynamic equilibrium. It's a device that rolls off the tongue, but you know, does it, is it something you really um, use to think about? Um, so thermodynamics. Well, um, as a little preliminary here, the traditional thermodynamics, the classical, is one of equilibrium systems. This is the one that's thought of by Boltzmann. And those systems are predictable because they are ones that you let go to equilibrium. Um, the other sort, that's sort of the previous deals, is the ones you push away from equilibrium. And traditionally, it was thought that if you push away from equilibrium, everything's going to become a mess, a total mess, you can't predict anything. What Brigitte showed was that initially that may be things get messier, but beyond a certain point, they structure themselves in interesting ways. So I, here's the cartoon now. Um, we'll start with the river system. This is a geographical uh, example. And I want to say it's both a literal example of a system, a physical system, a thermodynamical system that's going to go to equilibrium or be pushed away from equilibrium, but it's also a nice metaphor for the sort of things we see in, in, in our urban models. Um, so we take a holiday, we get a canoe, we go to the headwaters, and we get our picture taken, um, which we want to look energetic and impressive, and uh, start down the rivers. And this is what it actually looks like with the photographers in there. Photographer was there. Um, you don't actually have to do anything rivers don't know to work. This is the system going to equilibrium. And when it gets to equilibrium, the holiday is over because not only maybe you have to go back to work, but also the river's not going to work for you anymore. If you want to go further, you'll actually have to paddle. And so if we do the same thing next year, same thing, you would end up at the same place and uh, the, um, this your equilibrium now, and this, this canoe river system is in equilibrium. And so that's predictable. You always know where you can come out. Wherever you start, whichever trigger you start, you'll end up at the same the mouth of the river. Now, if we start at the mouth of the river, two things are different now. One is we really do have to paddle, and maybe we have to paddle really hard. Um, so it's no longer just sort of cruise down the river, laying back in the boat. Um, and we end up somewhere, and then we go home. If we do it the next year, we will probably end up somewhere else. And any time we do it, uh, we could end up still in another place. Unless we have a map and pay attention to what we're doing, we probably will end up in another place. So, where will we end up? It's not really clear. The system is unpredictable. But of course, it's the same system. All you've done is reverse the direction of energy flow. So, the energy flow is going to go away from the building by putting energy into the system power. Um, and so, at every sort of fork as you go up river, um, you, the system, has to make a choice. And so the, the choice is partly context. Is there a fork or kind of is it a, a tiny tributary or a big mainstream so you're likely to go to the main one? It's partly a question of context and of chance. You're not paying attention or you don't have a map. Or maybe choice. Maybe you do have a map and you know where you want to go. So then you make a choice, which you may make a mistake because you're not paying attention. So um, the thing is, there are choices being made every step along the way. And this is what gives us the path dependence, or as Prigogine would talk about as a history, that you're not dealing with um, systems which has a history to it, and the history is important. You don't really know anything about where you are now unless you know about the history. In the other way, the classical approach, the uh, entropy maximizing, the history is irrelevant. 
it's a limit by the time you get there. You don't know where you came from, you don't care where you came from, because you know where you're going to be. Now we can diagram this with the bifurcation diagram, uh, where as you put more energy into the system, you get more possible system states, more different tributaries you could be in. And now we can make a link back to the urban system. If we have this case where there's distance is a real sort of impediment to movement, in an urban system, as we model it there by the two different approaches, basically there's one, only one outcome. All the centers are about the same size. So in that sense, they're sort of intriguing. And that's shown by the fact that for that initial range of energy there, you have only one possible system state. <coughs> Beyond a certain point there, you get two system states. Um, and some of the places will become very small or disappear. And one will become large. We maybe don't know which one. That's a game of choice or chance or whatever. Um, but you know that there will be that sort of structuring. It's now a more complicated system than it was before. Uh, and notice here look, that, that distance exponent is running in the other direction on the x-axis, just so that it's too confusing. Um, that's why the arrow is going to be So it could be that in the past, when Portugal was, if we go back a couple thousand years, there were maybe there were villages everywhere, but everyone was more like every the other. Then it went to a bunch of bifurcations and which is more complex than this, but uh, in this area, Porto managed to become a big place and Cremero is fairly big, but it's definitely a level or so below Porto um, in terms of population and regional influence and so on. Uh, but it could have been the other way around if, if, if when Portugal went to a bifurcation point. Uh, maybe it could be. I suspect there was some chance it could have been the other way. So, um, no, there's the other way. Now, bifurcation is not always that dramatic in terms of CA. Um, and this is a uh, model probability map that is not what proportion of times the model for the residential uh, line is on the cell. There's some areas of about half, 50 50, so between 40 and 60% probability. Those are ones where the model doesn't really say sometimes one, sometimes the other. Um, and so those are in a sense bifurcation, uh, representing <coughs> spatial bifurcations. Um, and that's, um, sometimes you get major ones of that sort, but I'd say most of them are probably fairly minor, like this would be a typical sort of uh, example of a spatial bifurcation, <coughs> the things in there you see in intermediate probabilities. So here's sort of a, a summation of what the properties of these uh, models of systems with bifurcations, which many of our models do have, whether we look for them or not. Um, each run of the model represents a, gives you a particular history. Um, you get multiple runs and you get an ensemble of histories, and these multiple runs then map out the possibilities. They in effect give you the root map of the root system. Um, and the process that the model embodies <coughs> is generic, in particular um, outcomes are specific. Okay. And so, uh, just as sort of another point which I won't take up, but I think one of the nice things about this physical approach to complexity theory is it explicitly makes the link to energy, energy flows. And that's important for all of us, and it's something we never uh, really included in the models themselves. And I think that's, that's one big opportunity waiting for someone to, to pick up. Okay, so what can we do with all this stuff? Well, um, here's an example talking first about calibration. In calibration, the problem is first we start off with the data set, typically, usually, you know, often, usually, we have one data set and we're calibrating the data set. Um, now we build a model, but first we, before we calibrate, we have to have the model. So we build a model and we run it, and uh, we get simulation results that look like that. Some of them actually replicate the data nicely, and others don't replicate it nicely at all. So what does that mean? Well, it might mean that we have a bad model. Or it might mean we have a good model, but it's a bad calibration. Or it might mean we have a good model and a good calibration, uh, but it doesn't look like it. Um, but that's because actually the system we're modeling is one that has a bifurcation in it, like that. Uh, but how do we know? And this is a big problem. Before I go back to that, go on with this how do we know issue though, I want to just take one little bit of an aside to something I think is very important, in a, in potentially in a practical sense, but also in a, in when we're just simply calibrating models. Um, over calibration is a real risk in models that go through bifurcations. Um, because it hides the possible futures. And so, if we've overcalibrated a model, this is all we know about. Every time we run the model, uh, we'll get basically the same results. So our results look fabulous, but they're wrong. Um, if we actually know about the um, uh, bifurcation phenomenon, 
what's happening is if you put more energy into the system, the, on the left, we, we, if we start down there where there's only one possible system state, there we, we, we just we see what's happening. Beyond the bifurcation, that's, that, that system state remains um, one of the steady states of the system. It's a solution. If we think of the equation, it's a major solution to the equation. But it's now an unstable one. It's a repeller, not an attractor. What this means is when you go through the bifurcation point, the business as usual scenario becomes inoperative. You may carry on doing what you were doing, but the results are not going to be like they were before. They will be radically different. But how will be the improvement? Well, you can't say it will be one way or the other, depending on which way you go through the bifurcation. Now, if you actually go through a bifurcation, you know it, and you know you ended up on a state you didn't really like, like maybe Europe is in now with the way the Euro was constructed or introduced or something. How do you get to the other place? Well, then you, um, that's not so easy. Maybe you could do it, maybe you can map out a way, but because you have to go to this repeller, there's this real, in the physical systems, energy barrier, and in human systems also, something that probably looks like a, a, a financial barrier, austerity, but that also probably involves energy and also at some point. Um, and so this is what it looks like. This is Klaus Kinski and his movie Fitzgerald, where you sail up the wrong river, and you realize that and then he wasn't going to go back again, so he was trying to hold the boat over the um, repeller, the mountain, or separating the reservoir from the other one. Um, so you don't really want to be in that position. That's why it's nice not to over-calibrate. You want the most important thing for many applications is to know what are the possibilities. It's not to know you can predict exactly what the line will be in 2030. It's to know what are the possible ways your city could look then, and which ones do you like, and that sort of thing. But you don't want to over-calibrate and eliminate knowing of those possibilities. Okay, so going back to how do you know, this is in the sense of validation. Um, I think traditional um, hypothesis testing is almost always basically irrelevant for us. We just can't do it. Um, people have alluded to that fact ever since this conference began. Um, the, there are all sorts of new ways of testing models that are appearing, and all, some of those have also been talked about. Um, but these new methods mostly will reflect in one way or another the sort of uncertainty and messiness that we find in these complex systems that we're involved in. Um, and so each test we make will be indicative, it'll give us some information, but it won't be conclusive. It won't, it won't be, yes, now we know the theory is right or the model is right. It's just, well, at least it's not wrong. We can see that it doesn't look wrong on the basis of what we're testing. And so multiple successive tests will in increase our confidence in the model, though we'll never sort of prove that the model is the right one. Uh, and an additional complication is that, that these tests will sort of involve spatial um, characteristics. And that's a big problem as well. Alex is the one to lecture on this because he's developed and is developing a number of these techniques. They have all sorts of things from the capital, which I think is mostly one we probably shouldn't be using, but we do because it's so easy and it's all the way down through various sorts of things um, to fractal dimensions, which actually aren't just the, the well, they are abstract, some of them are more abstract than others. And I could talk about all of those, but I won't. Um, but I do want to talk a little bit about fractal dimensions, uh, because they're useful, and specifically in this question of avoiding over calibration and also validation. Um, the thing is that when you look at fractal dimensions, uh, various systems, they tend to have be stable over long periods and over lots of different situations. That is, fractal dimensions of cities in many ways, as people from Puzzle uh, Soul know, having uh, worked with uh, Cliff Frankhouse, the, um, they tend to be stable, very stable from one city to another, from one year to another. So that, that means, unlike the dynamics we're simulating in the model, this gives them a uh, real usefulness for um, validation, calibration and validation. Um, but if, if, because we, our models need to reproduce them, and if the model can't, then there's something wrong with the calibration of the model. So here's an example of that. Um, a cluster size frequency diagram, where we have the log of cluster size on the x-axis, and we want uh, how many times a cluster of that size occurs in our, in our map, our simulated map. Um, now here, I didn't show you the map for the actual land use in 1990, this is double the um, but this is the map for 2056 generated by the simulation model, and there's the cluster size frequency diagram. And you can see it remains linear in this calibration of this model, and the slope, in fact, remains almost identical. So 
So this is a test that this model has passed. It doesn't show you half of, that you've got the right calibration, but it does rule out a lot of bad calibrations that might look really good, even better than this calibration. In fact, I, I say that with confidence because I have calibrated this particular model to get really great results to the um, data I'm using to calibrate it and even the validation data. But um, running it through like this long in the future, you find that the crop of the goes haywire. So I know I over calibrated and done something. So I can, I can uh, rule out a lot of bad calibrations this way, but it doesn't tell me it's a good calibration. It just says it's not one of the bad ones. Uh, or it's not, it's, there are certain process problems that it's not. Um, so they provide one partial solution uh, to this problem. Verification. Um, in the model I showed you in part one here, the, the, because we're modeling two different, we're modeling two different things, land use and activity levels. Um, and that has a real advantage um, in terms of model validation and verification because we're now doing two different things with one model. And that means we've got to optimize two different things. The activity predictions, the population predictions for each, say, statistical area that we're looking at within the region, and also the land use, how are we going to measure it? Um, if we get a trade-off between these two, if we're trying to calibrate the model, we find there's no calibration that anything that we do that optimizes one of those makes the other one go bad, then there's something structurally wrong with the model because you basically can't calibrate it both of those things. But notice, if we weren't modeling two things, we could get an excellent calibration for either one of them with a great model. So now the fact that we have um, this little problem that we're modeling uh, several things with one model, um, tells us something about the quality of the model. Here's just a brief example. Um, the green cells are the same in uh, both in both the model and the reality of the model output. In reality, the blue ones are, are residential cells that were put there by the model but weren't there in reality in this year, and red was vice versa. So uh, what you see there is, um, uh, well, sorry, I got a little bit of this. What, what you see there is, um, that there, it's putting too much uh, residential land around some of these fringe cities, uh, towns around around town. Um, and it was either have that and poor population estimates for the counties of the Dublin region, or have poor uh, or have great estimates of the land use but poor population estimates. I say way. So this was a problem that it turned out. It, it, you know, trace it to the equation in the model that represents the diseconomies of agglomeration, if you remember what I was talking about, the neighborhood effect. So by changing the form of that equation in sort of a ratio of exponential form to a different form, actually this problem was um, greatly reduced, not entirely eliminated, but greatly reduced. So that um, now there's still maybe a little too much of the blue around the suburban towns, but uh, much less than there was. So this is a case where you where if you do put more into a model, it actually makes it easier to verify. Um, well, backwards or something. Um, in general terms, and someone I think Mike actually mentioned Hopper, what we've got here is a case where um, by putting more into a given model, we're predicting more. Um, it becomes more difficult to, to have that model pass test. So it's risky in the parian sense. So that's a good thing because then the fact that it doesn't fail in a particular test means that we have more confidence in it than we would have if it's only doing one thing and it passed that test. So just as a final note here, there'll be um, uh, some things where we probably really never know what's going on. And here's an example sort of like on the left, you have the 1990 land just a Dublin area on the right, that simulation result which you already saw, which looks to be very reasonable, except that notice you see all the string development along the road, you don't actually, you can't tell where the roads are at all on the left in 1990. In the simulation, it's sort of phenomenal, you begin to see the road somewhere around 19, uh, sorry, 2020, something like that. Um, so right now it doesn't look like that either. So it could be simply a bad calibration or a bad model for what I line up. And I mentioned before the fact where I said, well, it's got the right front of dimension. The fact that it's the right front of dimension doesn't mean this is a good calibration. It could still be a bad one. Um, and maybe this is an example of how it's bad. But also working in, in, in Flanders, I see this sort of map, and it, the type of pattern is almost identical. So maybe the model is right and is well calibrated. And what it's saying is, 
if you don't take certain planning actions, um, 30 years from now, you'll have all the strip development along, along roads. But we don't know. I have no idea right now how you would know who the proper interpretation here. But at least the model is able to suggest that sort of question, raise it in people's consciousness. So conclusions, they're sort of the ob uh, uh, obvious things. I think we can do more with CA than we're doing right now, especially in bringing more theory into it or building new theory. Um, and I think the complexity theory can provide much useful guidance to, especially when it comes to things like calibration and validation. Um, and so, to go back to the title, we can use, the, this, this, we can use these sorts of CA to build new theory. Um, and I think it's a lot of fun, we feel like we're doing it. And now, um, in the spirit of this conference, I'm going to turn the rest of the talk over to uh, the Rule 1357 um, CA Life. CA did that. Well, I drew the original thing, but that was produced there by the CA. That's from, from that was one iteration to the next. So. Okay, so uh, are there questions or comments?
Cynthia, yeah, it is. I mean, and it's, it's also a personal problem. I think the first step at which we all have problems with over calibration, maybe it's just me, but I don't think so. When I'm there trying to calibrate, I get totally gross at it. I want to get the best results I can. I like my model. I want it to look good. And so I will always over calibrate. That's how I know about the usefulness of these practical measures, because so many times I have to go back and uncalibrate to get to get those things. So that my final thing by various measures you might make of your language pattern or whatever the population projections of the model are not as good as I can get. But at least they preserve some of these basic system measures that I know have to be preserved on the project. So but the psychology is very difficult. You know, I always start out with calibrating, I must confess. I, mean, I think most people are probably the same, but then you get in this situation you're describing where it's even worse. These people want to model it tells them something exactly that looks great and you can show that it really gives good results. And somehow you've got to convince them that it's not case. I don't know how you do that without having you know, the whole world educated in complexity theory and principles of bifurcated systems and so on and things like that. But you know, maybe at some point we get that sophisticated in our sort of knowledge. Um, and yeah, I think yeah, in principle it can be done. So you, I mean you can make an argument, show some simple demonstrations that really what you want to know is what are the possibilities you don't want to be able to exactly what your city will look like in, in 20, 30, because they know as well as you know that you can't do that exactly. So if you can show them some very impressive work by Nobel Prize winners that shows why they shouldn't think of this, maybe they'll begin to listen. I don't know if they felt well. Sure. But I should say also on this topic, um, though, uh, that probably the best paper on the whole thing, which I'd love to, to refer people to, is by Dan Brown and IJGIS in, IJG, IJG, I think, 2005 or something like that. Because um, he has an incredibly clear example of an artifact or a model he made that he, and he generated results and then he calibrated the model, optimized the calibration to the, to one of the, it had bifurcation, so, so he calibrated it to one of the results, because you only have one data set, right? You don't have, we don't have a hundred different realizations of Porto in the year 2012, we only have one realization. But so in the simulation environment, you can do that. And so then he said, okay, we only have one to be In reality, we only know one of these outcomes if, it, if that's the real one. So we're now calibrate to that data set. And what he showed was, you get a complete miscalibration. But it looks brilliant. The correct calibration performs really poorly because half the time it's predicting something entirely different. And yet it's the right one. And it's telling you what is inherent in the system. So I recommend that paper that we Dan Brown is easy.
then I don't think we have much confidence at all. But we really don't know. I think, um, and so I mean, in the short answer, I don't know how much confidence I should have in this. I don't think any of us know. But I, I do think, because we can see, it's, this is one of the nice things about sort of modeling we're dealing with. And in general, complex systems, bottom up modeling, we tend to start with small, immediate processes. Like we know anything's going to work every day, or we know we're, we're um, buying the land to live on, or to build a house. So if we, if we stay near to those basic processes that we live every day, we have a good intuitive understanding at that level. We don't have nearly as good an intuitive understanding of what the macroscopic outcome of all these, this interaction of all these millions of people doing those things together, frustrating each other, and helping each other. That's where the models come in. But if we start with these things we know something about, have some confidence in those relations, probably the model isn't wholly wrong. Uh, and then if we're able to calibrate over some period of real data, that gives a little bit more confidence. So I don't know how much confidence we should have, but I think we probably can have more confidence, a little bit more at least, than we would have if we didn't have a model at all. I think the model, and at least it raises questions that probably should be thought about, as in the case there the flying of the Dublin. I may just continue with that question. Like, um, I have uh, visited it a project that was at Vitina Kamsa, and then they wanted to look at how the future of area will go, and then they wanted to use that as a base to develop their urban planning program, and then basically to lay out their infrastructure like a whole network system. Well, in our CA modeling part, we consider those like a whole network. Grew, 